Well, I think I'm, we're about we're ready. ready to start. Let's start with some prayer. Father, we thank you that your spirit is with us. We pray that you'll bless and guide us as we try to look at your word and understand that word in some way better. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've been talking about uh, Paul's third missionary journey. It's in Acts 18.23 to 26.32. Uh, he, James was written in 44 A.D. Gospel of Mark 50 A.D. 1st and 2nd Thessalonians 54 A.D. And now we're at 55 A.D. So we're approximately less than 25 years, maybe 30 years, something like that, after the death of Jesus Christ. So we're not that far past it. Uh, we talked about Paul being the author from Ephesus on the fourth year he was in Ephesus about 54 to 56 AD on his third missionary journey the church at Corinth he's, is where he sent it from he started this church it's definitely his second letter because he sent a previous letter I wrote you uh, purpose Paul wrote for three reasons he said to draw the church back together as a spirit of unity in one body of Christ to deal with moral laxity remember they had a guy sleeping with his stepmother and to answer certain questions and the church had requested of Paul to Paul. We're down in number three now. We're answering questions that they sent to him. Uh, he says, as for your questions, and he starts answering those. The biggest problem we have is we do not have the questions. That would be really good to have. I'm going to point out in a couple of places. Uh, we are currently, if you have this outline, and you probably don't, y'all all left it probably at home, we're on Roman numeral 5. I never got D. one. Do you have any more? I have one left. No, I don't want to take yours. You can have, I can print another one at home. Pardon me? I'm not going to use it. You can print another one at home. I can print another one at home. We'll share now. So, Paul has been talking about uh, the discipline that a pastor has to have. You've all been to the stadium and seen the athletes race. Everyone runs, one wins run to win. All good athletes train hard. They do it for a good medal, gold medal that tarnishes and fades. You're after one that's gold eternally. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard to the finish. I'm giving it everything I've got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and on top of condition. I mean, not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else all about it and then missing out on it myself. Then we start talking about questions on Christian liberty. Again, we don't know the questions, but he seems to have had some questions about uh, the liberty that we have. Remember our history, friends, and he warned, and be warned. All our ancestors were led by the provincial, providential cloud and taken miraculously through the sea. They went through the waters in a baptism like ours as Moses led them from a slave death to salvation life. They all ate and drank identical food and drink, meals provided daily by God. They drank from the rock, God's fountain for them. They stayed with them wherever they were, and the rock was Christ. But just experiencing God's wonders and grace don't seem to mean much. Most of them were defeated by temptation during the hard times in the desert, and God was not pleased. Now, as I read that, what did that say to you? Anyway. They were human. They, <laughs> they had good intentions, but they got tired of what was the, the menu, the food. And, and how long are we going to have to do this? Yes, uh, that's one thing. I think another thing is they saw all the miracles. They saw miracles happening almost daily. And yet, they lost the promised land. All but two lose the promised land out of millions. Mm -hmm. A whole generation lost it. Why? Because they did not follow God. They kept tempting him. They were tempted to do things they shouldn't be doing. So just because you have all these miracles around you, uh, I want you to remember you know, somebody would say, well, if we had a great pastor, all our people would be Christian. <laughs> did Judas Iscariot have a great pastor? <laughs> and what did he do? Betrayed him. 
So it's not the pastor. And it's not our miracles working around. It's how we live our life on a day-to-day basis is what he's getting at. It's like that uh, athlete he was talking about, the runner. If he only practiced on Mondays, do you think he'd ever win the Olympics? No way. Mm-hmm. If he just practiced Monday and Thursday, maybe. It's a daily thing to get yourself prepared to live for Christ. The same thing could happen to us. We must be on guard so that we never get caught up in wanting our own way as they did. And they must not, and we must not turn our religion into a circus as they did. First the people partied, then they threw a dance. We must not be sexually promiscuous. They paid that for that. Remember that 23,000 deaths in one day? You must never try to get Christ to serve us instead of us serving him. They tried it, and God launched an epidemic of poisonous snakes. You must be careful not to stir up discontent. Discontent destroyed them. These are all warning markers, dangers, in our history books written down so that we don't repeat them. They're mistakes. Our positions in the story are parallel. They at the beginning and we at the end. We are just as capable of messing up as they were. Don't you be so naive and so confident and self-confident. You're not exempt. You can fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Cultivate God's confidence. No test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of those what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He'll never let you be pushed past your limit. He'll always be there to help you come through. Sometimes I wonder if he knows where my limit is. Uh, but he'll never push you past it. You can resist sin. That's what this is saying. You can. Most of us just give up after one. Oh, don't go away, Satan. Oh well, I guess I'll do it. Everybody else is doing it. So why can't we? Do it? We can rationalize almost anything in our minds. But the truth is, what he's saying is, you'll never be pushed past your limit. And I think that limit means about your limit to resist sin in your life. Now, there may be a huge amount of pressure on you, but you can stand it. Questions about Christian liberty. Limits of freedom. And I think you preached on this fairly recently, didn't you? Mm -hmm. So my very dear friends, when you see people reducing gods to something you can use or control, get out of their company as fast as you can. I assume I'm addressing believers now who are mature. Draw your own conclusions. When you drink the cup of blessing, aren't you taking into your, ourselves the blood, the very life of Christ, and isn't it the same with the loaf of bread? We break and eat. Don't we take into ourselves the body, the very life of Christ, because there is one loaf, our meaningness becomes oneness. Christ doesn't become a fragmented in us, rather we become unified in him. We don't reduce Christ to what we are, where he raises us up to what he is. That's basically what happens in an old, even in old Israel. Those who ate the sacrifices offered to God altar entered into God's action at the altar. Do you see the difference? Sacrifices offered to idols are offered to nothing. Well, what's the idol but a nothing? Or worse than nothing, a minus, a demon. I don't want you to become part of something he reduces you to less than you yourself. And you can't have it both ways, banqueting with the master one day and slumming with the demons the next. Besides, the master won't let you put up with it. He wants us all or nothing. Do you think you can get off with anything less? Looking at one way, you could say anything goes because God immersed immense generosity and grace. We don't have to be to we don't have to dissect and scrutinize every action to see if it will pass muster. But the point is not to just get by. We want to live well. But our foremost effort should be to help others live well. With that as a base to work from, common sense can take you the rest of the way. Eat anything sold in the butcher shop, for instance. You don't have to run an idle test on every item. The earth, after all, is God's and everything in it. That everything includes, certainly includes the leg of lamb on the butcher shop. If a non-believer invites you to dinner, 
and you feel like going, go ahead and enjoy yourselves and every, eat everything placed before you. It would be both bad manners and bad spiritually to cross-examine your host on the ethical purity of each course as it is served. On the other hand, if he goes out of his way to tell you that this or that was sacrificed to God or to or goddess see so-and-so, you should pass it. Even though you may be indifferent as to where it came from, he isn't. And you don't want to send mixed messages to him about who you are worshiping. But except these special cases, I'm not going to walk around on eggshells worrying about what small-minded people might say. I'm going to strive free and easy, knowing what our large-minded master has already said. If I eat what is served to me, grateful to God for what is on the table, then I can worry about what's then I, how can I worry about what someone will say? I thank God for it, and he blessed it. So eat your meals heartily. Don't worry about the others say about you. You're eating to God's glory after all, not to please them. As a matter of fact, do everything that way and heartily and freely God's glory. At the t same time, don't be callous in your excess of freedom. Thoughtful, thoughtless stepping on the toes of others who aren't as free as you are. I try my best to be considerate of others' feelings in all these matters. I hope you will be too. Now, he's really struggling with the thing here. He said it both ways, actually, it seems. I'm going to live fully and do whatever I want to do because really, honestly, what I eat doesn't really matter. It's all God's. He's given it to us. Uh, he's I ask him for a blessing. But maybe I should be careful about some of that. Why should we be careful? Because uh, those sacrifices that are open to animals, even though they might not hurt the Christians, their uh, influence on somebody that is not might keep them from worshiping God if they hadn't seen that example of a Christian. That's true, and it's also if you've got a, a young Christian who's still struggling with these ideas, mm -hmm. and you go on and eat it, says, well, I'll eat it too, and pretty soon he's slipping back into idol worship. He said, no, it doesn't matter. Uh, so we need to be careful about how we use our Christian freedom. Questions concerning worship. The customs of the Christian church. Now we're moving on down into another section. Some questions have been sent to him about Christian worship. It pleases me that you continue to remember and honor me by keeping up the traditions of the faith I taught you. All actual authority stems from God. In a marriage relationship, there's authority from Christ to the husband and from the husband to the wife. The authority of Christ is the authority of God. Any man who speaks with God and about God in a way that shows a lack of respect for the authority of, uh, of Christ dishonors Christ. In the same way a wife who speaks with God in a way that shows a lack of respect for the authority of her husband dishonors her husband. Worse, she dishonors herself. An ugly sight, like a woman with her head shaved. This is basically the origin of those customs we have of women wearing a head covering in worship while men take their hats off. By these symbol, symbolic acts, men and women who far too often butt heads with each other, submit their heads to the head, God. Now, he is not adding something for women to do. In traditional Hebrew worship, men and women both would cover their heads during prayer time. He's actually taking something away from the men that they shouldn't be wearing their head covering when they pray uh, Paul says men should pray with their heads uncovered, their heads bare, uh, bared, so that uh, they can show proper respect and reverence for God in their submission to God, basically. So he's not adding something to women. He's just saying men don't have to wear their hats. Now, again, we don't know the question, what, what, what was so important there. Don't, by the way, read too much into the differences between men and women. That's an interesting statement we will come back to in a little bit. Neither man nor women can go it alone or claim priority. Men are created first as a beautiful, shining reflection of God. That is true. But the head of a woman's body clearly outshines in beauty the head of her, 
the head of her husband. The first woman came from man, true. But ever since then, every man comes from a woman. And since virtually everything comes from God anyway, let's quit going through these who's first routines. Don't you agree that there's something naturally powerful in the symbolism uh, of a woman, her beautiful hair reminiscent of angels praying in adoration, a man, his head bared into reverence, praying in submission? I hope you're not going to be all argumentative about this. All God's churches see it this way. I don't want you standing out as an exception. So he's saying that men and women are not as far different as you think they are, but he just thinks it looks good. And is that the impression y'all got, or have y'all got another impression? Don't make a big issue of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Regarding the next item, I'm not at all pleased. I'm getting the picture, this is the Lord's Supper they're messing up. I'm getting the picture that you meet together, it brings out your worst side instead of your best. First I get this report on your divisiveness, competing with and criticizing each other. I'm reluctant to believe it, but there it is. The best that can be said for it is that the testing process will bring truth into the open and confirm it. And then I find that you're bringing your division to worship. You come together. And instead of eating the Lord's Supper, you bring a lot of food from the outside and make pigs of yourself. Some are left out and go home hungry. Others have to be carried out, too drunk to walk. I can't believe it. Don't you know, have your own homes to eat and drink in? Why would you stoop to desecrating God's church? Why would you actually shame God's poor? I, will, I never would have believed you would stoop to this, and it's not going to stand for nothing. The question seems to be here. Uh, that Paul has to deal with in communion is that they have turned communion into a potluck. <laughs> and the first ones through pile their plate as high as they can, and the last ones through don't have anything to eat. And they just got the wrong impression, uh, Paul says, but that's really what he seems to be saying to them. Uh, and it's a, instead of being a commemoration of Jesus, it's a time to get out of it what you can get out of it for your own uh, eating purposes. So we should be careful how we approach communion. Anybody have anything else to say? Well, they want to say on that? Today, communion is not a, a meal, it's, it's symbolic. Mm -hmm. It's a little piece of bread and a little piece of juice. It's not something that people eat to fill up on, and mm -hmm. everybody realizes that, so maybe it's easier now. It might be easier now. It probably, they probably had communion after every service. So do this as often as you meet and remember to me. And 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 we eat, we have communion in there, and and then we eat out here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but anyway, it seems that they have really messed up communion. I mean, that's hard to mess up. We can be mad out here when everybody eats all the fried okra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> could be first. Yeah. yeah. So let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it's so centrally important. I received my instructions from the Master himself. I guess that's when he was in Arabia he met with Jesus. And passed them on to you. The Master Jesus on the night he, of his betrayal took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this remember, to remember me. After supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is the blood of my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat bread, this bread, and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in his, your words and actions the death of the master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. Anyone who eats the bread and drinks the cup of the master irreverently is like part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death. Is that the kind of remembrance you want to be part of? Examine your motives. Test your heart. Come to this meal in holy awe. If you have no thought or worse don't care about the broken body of the master, when you eat and drink, you're running the risk of serious consequences. That's why so many of you even now are ill are listless and sick, and others have gone to an early grave. 
If you get this straight now, you won't have to be sentenced like sentenced. Yeah, you won't have to be straightened out later on. Better to be confronted by the master now than face a fiery confrontation. So, my friends, when you come together for the Lord's table, be reverent and courteous with one another. If you're so hungry that you can't wait to be served, go home and get a sandwich. But by no means risk turning the meal into an eating and drinking binge or a family squabble. It's a spiritual meal, a love feast. The other things you ask about, I'll respond to in person when I make my next visit. Anybody have any questions or thoughts on that? Now Paul's got a big thing to deal with. For the next, really, two chapters, uh, says 12th chapter, but 12th and 13th in my opinion, he's going to be dealing with the problems concerning spiritual gifts. Now, he says every one of us have a spiritual gift. If you become a Christian, you've got spiritual gifts. They list some of them in the Bible. I'm not sure it's a complete list. I don't uh, claim it's a complete list, but it uh, is a good list uh, for us to think about. God gave you that gift, not to use it for yourself, but to build up the body of Jesus Christ. And we need to understand that. And the question then comes, not if you have a gift, but how well are you using your gift? Well, they had a lot of problems. What I want to talk about now is the various ways God's Spirit gets working into our life. It's worked into our lives. This is the complex and often misunderstood, but I want you to be informed and knowledgeable. Remember how you were when you didn't know God, led from one phony God to another, never knowing what you were doing, just doing it because everybody else did it? It's different in this life. God wants us to use our intelligence to seek to understand as well as we can. For instance, by using your head. You know perfectly well that the Spirit of God would never prompt someone to say, Jesus is damned. N nor would anyone who's be inclined to say, Jesus is master, without the insight of the Holy Spirit. God's various gifts are handed out everywhere. But they all originate in God's Spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere. But they all originate in God's Spirit. God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere. But God himself is behind it all. Every person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets, it on, everyone gets in on it, everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful, wise counsel, clear understanding, simple trust, healing the sick, miraculous acts, proclaiming, distinguishing, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. All these gifts have a common origin. They're handed out one by one, one by one by one Spirit of God. He decides who gets and what. You can easily enough see how this kind of thing works by looking at no further than your own body. Your body has many parts, limbs, organs, cells, but no matter how many parts you can name, you're still one body. It's exactly the same with Christ. By means of his one Spirit, we all said goodbye to our partial and piecemeal lives. We each used our we we each used to independently call our own shots, but then we entered into a large and integrated life in which he was the final say in everything. This is what we proclaim at word in action when we are baptized. Each of us is now part of the resurrection body, refreshed and sustained at one fountain, his spirit, where we all come to drink. The old labels were once used to identify ourselves. Labels like Jew and Greek, slave and free, are no longer useful. We need something larger, more comprehensive. I want you to think about how all this makes you more significant, not less. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. If a foot said, I'm not elegant, like the head embellished with rings, I guess I'm not belonging to the body. Would you make it so? If ears said, I'm not beautiful like I, and limpid and expressive, I don't deserve a place on the head, would you want to remove it from the body? If the body was all I, how could it hear? 
if all ear, how can it smell? As it is, we see that God has carefully placed each part of the body right where he wanted it. So I want you, also want you to think about how this keeps your significance from getting down, blown away. Eh, how this keeps your significance from getting blown up, up into self-importance. For no matter how significant you are, it's only because of what you are a part of. In an enormous eye or a gigantic hand wouldn't be a body, but a monster. What we have is not is one body with many parts, and each is proper size and in its proper place. No part is important on its own. Can you imagine an eye telling a hand, get lost, I don't need you? Or head telling foot, you're fired, your job has been phased out. As a matter of fact, in practice it works the other way. The lower part the more basic and therefore necessary you can live without an eye, for instance, but not without a stomach. When it's part of your own body you are concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part is visible or close, higher or lower. You give it dignity and honor just as it is, without comparison. If anything, you have, no, have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. If you have to choose, wouldn't you prefer good digestion to full-bodied hair? The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part depended on every other part. The parts we mention and the parts we don't. The parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, other part, every other part is involved in the hurt. And in the healing, if one is flourishing, then other part, and every other part enters into the exuberance. You are Christ's body. That's who you are. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part of the body that does your part mean anything. You're familiar with some of the parts of the body God has formed into a church. This is his body. Apostles, prophets, teachers, miracle workers, healers, helpers, organizers, those who pray in tongues. But don't be oblivious by now, isn't it? But, but it ought to be obvious by now. Isn't it that Christ's church is a complete body and not a gigantic, undimensional part, unidimensional part? I'm not all apostle, not all prophet, not all miracle worker, not all healer, not all prayer tongues, prayer of tongues, not all interpreter of tongues, and yet some of you keep competing for so called important parts. If you speak with human eloquence, now we've moved to the uh, 13th chapter. If you speak, with human elegance and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, you're nothing but a creaking of a rusty gate. If you speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if you have faith that says to a mountain, jump, you know, jumps, but you don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even so to the stake, go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. So no matter which of the gifts you have, they have to operate out of love. Now we need to define love. Some people define love as letting a person do whatever they want to do. Just not correcting people, or not fussing at people, not telling them that they're wrong, that that's not a good way to do it. That is not love. The loving thing to do to a child that is walking toward a heater if about to touch it is to scream at him and pull him back as hard as you can so that he doesn't do that. That's the loving thing to do. Oh, isn't that nice? He's going to experience heat. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's the way some people seem to think love is. And we need to realize love corrects people. I mean, I have that impression of Jesus. You know, we say, well, Jesus was love, yeah. And what did he do? He made a whip and ran everybody out of the temple. Because they were doing wrong. Because I think too many people nowadays think that acceptance equals love. Yes, that's, you know, that'd be a mm -hmm. good word for it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the problem. Acceptance doesn't equal love. In fact, mm -hmm. acceptance equals I don't love you. Mm -hmm. Accepting, oh, well, yeah, he's got to go touch that heater so he can learn. Mm -hmm. He can learn other ways. If I speak with you... Hmm? So, I, we read that. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. Doesn't have a swelled head. Doesn't force itself on others. Isn't always me first. Doesn't fly off the handle. 
doesn't keep score of the sins of others. doesn't reveal when, reveal when others grovel. T takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Notice half of the, over half of these are negative. Doesn't do this, doesn't do that, doesn't do the other. Love never dies. Inspired speech will be over someday. Praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limit. We know only a portion of the truth, and what we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete comes, our incompleteness will be canceled. When I was an infant at my mother's breast, I gurgled and cooed like an infant. When I grew up, I left those infant ways for good. You don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. You'll see it all then, see it all as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly just as he knows us. But the right now, for right now, until the completeness, we have three things to do to lead us toward that consummation. Trust steadily in God, hope, unswervingly, love extravagantly. The best of these three is love. Now we move into a few more questions. They're having a problem with tongues. Seems everybody wants to preach and uh, speak tongues. They think that's one of the highest gifts. And he starts to work on correcting that. Go after a life of love as if you life depended. Uh, on it because it does give yourself to the gifts of God gives you most of all try to proclaim his truth if you praise him in the private language of that tongues you yourself God yourself uh, God understands you but no one else does but you're sharing your mac in intimacies just between you and him but when you proclaim the truth to, in everyday speech you're letting er others in on the truth so that they can grow and be strong and experience his presence with you. The one who prays using a private prayer language certainly gets a lot out of it. But proclaiming God's truth to the church in its common language brings the whole church into growth and strength. I want all of you to develop intimacies with God in prayer. But please don't stop with that. Go on and proclaim his clear truth to others. It's more important that everyone have access to the knowledge and love of God in language everyone understands, then you go off and cultivate God's presence in a mysterious language prayer, prayer language. Unless, of course, there's someone who in, can interpret what you're saying for the benefit of all. Think, friends, if I come to you and all I do is pray privately to God in a way only he can understand, what are you going to get out of that? If you don't address you plainly with some insight or truth, proclamation, or teaching, what am I that what help am I to you? If musical instruments, flutes say, or harps don't play so that each note is distinct and in tune, how will anyone be able to catch the melody and enjoy the music? If the trumpet can call can't be distinguished, will anyone show up for the battle? So if you speak in a way no one can understand, what's your point of opening your mouth? There are many languages in the world and they all mean something to someone, but if I don't understand the language, I'm not going to do me much good. It's not, gift, it's not different with you. Since you're so eager to participate in God is doing, why don't you concentrate on doing what helps everyone in the church? So when you pray in your private prayer language, don't hoard the experience for yourself. Pray for the insight and ability to bring others into that intimacy. If I pray in tongues, my spirit prays, but my mind lays fallow and all the intelligence is wasted. But well, what's the solution? The answer is simple enough. Do both. I should be spiritually free and expressively expressive as I pray, but I should also be thoughtful and mindful as I pray. I should sing with my spirit and I sing with my mind. If I sing in blessing using your private prayer language, which no one else understands, how can some outsider who just shown up and has no idea of what's going on, know when you say amen. Your blessings might be beautiful, but you have very effectively cut that person out of it. I'm grateful to God for the gifts of praying in tongues that he gives us for praising him. 
which leads to wonderful intimacies we enjoy with him. I enter into this as much as I, or more than any of you. But when you're in the church assembled for worship, I'd rather say five words that everyone can understand and learn from than say 10,000 that sound to others like gibberish. To be perfectly frank, I'm getting exasperated with your infantile thinking. How long will you grow up? How long before you grow up and use your head, you adult head? It's all right to have a childlike unfamiliarity with evil, a simple know-it-all that's needed there. But there's far more to say yes to something. Only mature and well-exercised intelligence can save you from falling into gullibility. It's written in Scripture that God said, In strange tongues and from the mouths of strangers I'll preach to this people, but they'll never listen nor believe. So where does it get you? All the speaking in tongues no one understands. It doesn't help believers, and it only gives unbelievers something to gawk at. Plain, true speaking. On the other hand, goes straight to the heart of the believers and doesn't get in the way of unbelievers. If you come together as a congregation and some unbelieving outside, some believe, uh, unbelieving outsiders walk in, on you as you are all praying in tongues and unintelligible to each other and to them, won't they assume that you've taken leave of your senses and get out of there as fast as you can? But if some unbelieving outsiders walk in on a service where people are speaking out God's truth, the plain words will bring them up against the truth and probe their hearts. Before you know it, they're going to be on their faces before God, recognizing that God is among you. So don't you think, and I'm sitting here reading this, don't you think that those that have the gift of speaking in tongues, the Spirit's not going to allow them to do that if there's somebody there that can't interpret it? <coughs> that's, that's what he's going to get at in a little bit, okay, yes. I'm getting I think he's. I think that's what he's really trying to say. He's saying it would be much better to prophesy. Now, prophesying is not telling the future. Prophesying is telling forth God's Word. That's what... So Cindy prophesizes every Sunday. Uh, in the very beginning of the church, the speaking in tongues was a sign that the person had been filled baptized with the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit and mm -hmm. accepted as, as part of the Christian church. That was kind of, you know, as they went on to different groups, you know, they said, well, these people received the Spirit and Spirit spoke in tongues well, like we did, so people. God has accepted them. Mm -hmm. But maybe the church is moving on to a different phase now. I, All of these people that, that they're talking about, are they each one speaking in a, in a different tongue? I, I, just have, I just don't understand. Have you ever been in a Pentecostal service? No. Okay, well... Well, that's what I was just saying, because the Pentecostals still believe that if you cannot speak in tongues, that you have not been sanctified, as they call yeah. it. Now, uh, mm -hmm. yes, they, 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 they could all be, or several of them could be. Uh, there are two sides to this coin. And I think Paul's emphasizing that also here. One side is the public worship. The other side is the private worship and private prayer. He says he speaks in tongues more often than anybody in private times. But in public worship, it brings confusion because you hear things. Now, I can't tell you if uh, prayer language is a language I have known people to have a prayer language when they were speaking and somebody was there from Japan that understood what they were saying. I mean, they were speaking pretty good Japanese and never had heard it in their life. Well, okay, uh, these people that are speaking in tongues, where, where, did they get, where did they get what they're speaking? Did they just all of a sudden start? It's, okay, I have, by the Holy Spirit. I use a prayer language sometimes when I'm pre praying. I sometimes use it in worship, but I'm really quiet about it. Uh, or when we're, uh, uh, you know, but uh, the spare language, in my opinion, is God giving you the words to say and putting it in your mouth. As he said, your brain goes out of gear and your uh, spirit starts to speak. It's kind of like that same thing where it says you may not know what to pray for, but the spirit gives you groanings that utterances that no man can understand, but God... Well, that's that same kind of thing. And I believe it's a, sometimes you just get overwhelmed by the Spirit enough 
that you just need to speak in something that you can't you can't put it into words. Now, do I understand what I'm saying? No. I don't have the gift of interpretation. But I believe it's a language, it sounds like a language, it's, uh, it's not just the same sound over and over like ogi, ogi, ogi or something like that. It's, it's the same, it it's, it's, to me seems like a language because it's a whole bunch of words and syllables and everything else in it. Uh, but uh, if I were to get up and say the pastoral prayer in a prayer language, I believe that would be out of order in this church. I'm not saying in every church. If I was in a Pentecostal church, it might not be in, out of order. But yes, sometimes everybody's praying in a, uh, at the same time and nobody understands what anybody is saying. Uh, you know, they have a prayer time, let's all pray, and then they do. Out loud. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Out loud. Mm -hmm. Out loud. Uh, you know, some people, even shy like we have here, that pray silently, I'm pretty sure. But it's enough praying, it's just, it's a noise. And I understand it sounds like noise, and that's what Paul's problem is. If you have this noise going on and somebody like uh, uh, like you walks into church, <laughs> you'll turn around and walk back out. Uh, and that's not because God's Spirit isn't there. It's because it scares you. And so he's saying is we need to use the human language that people understand more. But they were looking at this as... Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of Pentecostal people do too. I want to have to admit that I'm superior to you because I have this language. Mm -hmm. No, it's not for me to be superior to you. No. Uh, if Cindy suddenly comes on my mind and I have no idea why, I may take off praying in spirit and pray for a while for her. I don't know what I just said, but I'm asking God, I think, for Cindy because she's on my mind. But I don't know what to pray for, uh, but the Spirit does. And so that's how it can be used as a tool within the church to build people up and to help other people. So uh, do I believe that God still gives speaking in tongues? Yes. Do I believe you have to speak in tongues to be baptized in the Spirit? No. Uh, but still, there is speaking in tongues in my opinion even today. I don't think any of these gifts went away. But you notice there's an interesting thing. And he's going to, I think, point it out eventually. Speaking in tongues is a two-part gift. If you're going to use it in the church, you've got to have an interpreter also. Whereas prophesying is a one gift. So you can actually get more out of prophesying than you can out of speaking in tongues and then having an interpreter. But I sometimes sing in uh, tongues also. Uh, but again, I do it under my voice so that <laughs> I'm not disturbing anybody around me uh, if I do it in a church. And if I'm not, if I'm just in my office and I get excited, I pray. Now, I'm just sharing with y'all what goes on in my life. Uh, I'm not pushing it on you. Don't say you have to do that. Uh, I mean, we're just, I'm just being open with you. Uh, the, the Church of Christ believes that, that speaking in tongues was one of the miracles that were given in the first century to aid in the establishment of yes. the church, and it no longer exists. They believe the tongues have ceased, like it says. They, they believe most of the gifts, and, all the gifts yes, have ceased. Yes, all, all the miraculous works. And uh, uh, that's unfortunate, uh, yeah. because I, they, then they don't have the uh, gifts of healing and all that kind of thing that we, uh, you know, we pray for people to be healed. Uh, so, anybody have anything else they want to say? I was thinking about the Catholics. You know, their service used to be in Latin. Yeah. I grew up in Pennsylvania, predominantly Catholic and I think area, that, and and uh, the priests would, you know, pray in Latin and. Because I guess, that, I guess the people knew what was going on, yeah, but I didn't. Their, <laughs> yeah. That was their language they used to. But number one, they number, stopped it. Number one, yeah. number two. In a Catholic service, it doesn't matter if you show up or not. If nobody showed up for church, he would still have the service. Uh -huh. Because it's what the priest does that is important. And the congregation is to a large extent observing what yeah, he does. they're witnessing it. 
So therefore, he's going to have the service whether anybody shows up or not. That's like saying mass for the uh, you know for dead people. Uh, you, have you heard ever heard of that? You know, I'm going to say five masses for you or yeah. some, him oh, yeah. or something like that. Well, that's what he does. He just goes there and he has a service. And whether there's anybody in the church or not, it doesn't matter. Yeah, and I didn't understand going to confession, <laughs> you know, before service, and then going out and doing the same thing tomorrow. <laughs> well, that's true. You didn't really confess it. Tell the priest well, what you did I, all week. And I doubt that that's what the doctrine actually is, but sometimes <laughs> people would take it that yes. way. <laughs> Well, that that sin has been forgiven, right? But <laughs> Don't where is where is the 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 justifying and the permanent grace that keeps you from doing it again? Doing it again, uh, repentance, right? Away from <laughs> right. The repentance means mm -hmm. turning to the opposite mm -hmm. way. Yeah, mm -hmm. my friends would have to go to confession before they could, you know, go to church and have communion. And it's well, I mean, you know, we're supposed to actually have prayer of confession before we take communion. We didn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. You're I mean, of, if I do the the yeah. great Thanksgiving and all that stuff, yeah. but yeah, yeah. It's, it's I want to finish. <laughs> I'm going to finish this page and I'm going to quit because the next one is very difficult. It's about women in church. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to and we have like our vegetables. That would take a while, <laughs> uh, and we'll do that start next. But let me finish this one. So here's what I want you to do: when you gather for worship, each one of you be prepared for something that will f useful for all. Uh, sing a hymn, teach a lesson, tell a story, lead a prayer, provide an insight. Uh, actually, one of the things I uh, was really impressed with was the Ukrainian Baptist Church. Before church, if you're an elder, uh, you would meet with the pastor. They would normally have three sermons, one, each one getting longer. The pastor does the last one. But he may look over and say, okay, you're going to do the first sermon, you're going to do the second sermon, you're going to do a devotional, and you're bringing our uh, hymn. And they got to be ready, because, I mean, that's five minutes before service starts. Mm -hmm. So you come <laughs> prepared to do a sermon. Mm -hmm. uh, the elders do. Now, not the others, but, you know, the elders, are kind of, they call them deacons. I, mean, I think we call them deacons. But anyway, those people are there to... Uh, uh, do that. So it's kind of interesting. If prayers are offered in tongues, two or three is the limit, and only when someone is present who can interpret what you're saying. Otherwise, keep it between you and God, between God and you, yourself. And no more than two or three speech, speakers in a meeting, with the rest of the listening and taking it to heart. Take your turn. No one person take over. Then each speaker gets a chance to say something special from God. And you all learn from each other. If you choose to speak, you're also responsible for how and when you speak. When you worship the right way, God won't stir us up to, into confusion, but brings us into harmony. This goes for all the churches, no exception. So, and then we will start at the next section uh, next time. Uh, you can keep that. Like I say, I can print well, out another one. We'll just bring more next time. We were sharing. Okay, I'll try to print out some more next time. Anybody have any questions, comments, statements, opinions? The other one's going to take longer than I think we have time for. I just wonder why Paul had to be, you know, I sometimes wonder what the, I don't know how to ask this question, what the intelligence of the people that he was talking to, because he repeated himself a lot.